Welcome to the Atheist of Florida YouTube channel. We are pleased to offer some of the most significant speakers and the profound issues of our times. If you like today's video, please hit the like button. If you have already subscribed, thank you. If not, you know what to do. Okay, well, uh, I kind of have a strange uh, background as far as religion goes. I was raised in a uh, relatively non-religious family, uh, kind of vaguely Protestant, I suppose, although I think my father was really an agnostic or, or, or really an atheist. Um, and by the time I was 12 or so, I considered myself an atheist um, and would argue with any of my friends or anybody that I knew that uh, had any religious belief at all. But then um, in high school, after I graduated from high school, I, my sister had, be, my older sister became converted to Catholicism. She got married and she took it pretty seriously. And I, so I got introduced to that, started going to mass with her, read the New Testament. And before too long, I convinced myself that I believed uh, that I was a Christian. And not only was I a Christian, but I was a Catholic. And not only that, I'm going to be a priest. So I ended up going to a traditionalist Catholic seminary, the seminary by Archbishop Lefebvre. I don't know if you are familiar with him, but he got excommunicated for uh, ordaining, uh, uh, consecrating bishops without the Pope's approval. And, he, you know, it, he had seminaries that were uh, you know, the old old church uh, seminaries and traditionalist seminaries, and I attended that. And it wasn't too long, though, in the first semester of, of that seminary where I, it, my old uh, skepticism started to come back. And I, the, the main things that got me was the existence of the idea of hell um, and, uh, and evolution, because they were anti-evolution as well. But the idea that hell, that there would be such a place as hell, that most of my family and pretty much all of my friends would be in hell, uh, was something I just couldn't, um, I couldn't accept. And so I ended up leaving the seminary because I felt like I couldn't be a good Catholic priest. I was still a Catholic, although I, a kind of a shaky one by the time that experience was over. Ended up getting married to a, to a traditionalist Catholic woman and a young, young woman. And we had four kids almost right immediately, you know, within, um, I guess it was within s s seven or eight years. And we would have had a lot more, but then um, one, I, it finally caught up with me. And I, 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 I can remember the moment when I was coming, we were coming home on a camping trip, my wife and I and our, and our little baby youngest boy was with us. And I told my wife that I just, uh, I just can't pretend any longer. I can't pretend to believe this any longer. Um, I, and I don't. And so that made it very difficult for her, of course, because she had been raised traditionalist Catholic and took it very seriously. But surprisingly, after a couple of weeks of her tr trying very hard to justify her beliefs, she ended up abandoning her, her beliefs as well and has never looked back. Um, that was about 1989. Um, our four kids were baptized. Um, the, the last one just barely snuck in there uh, before we ended up losing our, our beliefs. And, um, and then that, that uh, sister that had become a Catholic that had an influence on me, she ended up becoming a Jehovah's Witness. And I was trying to talk her out of that before she got baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. And so I decided in order to do that, I would have to read the Bible. Up to that time, I'd never read the whole Bible. I'd read the New Testament and bits and pieces of the old, but I, although I tried, I could never make it through Leviticus. I don't know how anybody makes it through Leviticus. But um, I decided I, I, I would have to, so in order to talk her out of it. So I started reading the Bible, and I didn't get too far before I decided, you know what, I... I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to produce a Bible 
from a skeptic's point of view, like an annotated Bible, like the Oxford annotated Bible, but done from a skeptic's uh, point of view that highlights all of the, you know, all the stuff that would be of interest that somebody should know about before they decide they're going to accept the Bible as being true. And so that's where the <clears throat> SAB, the idea for the SAB came from was, um, was that uh, at that time period. And so that um, I began, and just began with Genesis and started going through. And of course, this was before the internet. So it was all done with index cards and paper. And it was uh, kind of a crazy endeavor. And I started using some software as well, but I didn't have uh, it. it I, you know, it was all, it was before the internet. So it was, um, it was very difficult to, to do. Um, but I did, I eventually got it all laid out in, in book form and was looking for a publisher. I uh, really couldn't find one and ended up just letting it set for a little while, for a few years actually, until the internet came up. And then I knew I could get it on there. And so in, in 1999, I created the Skeptics Annotated Bible website. And of course, uh, I've been at it ever since. <clears throat> so that's kind of how it started. And it's, uh, I, I'm sure it's a, it's a project that no one person could ever do a decent job on. Uh, you know, it's just way too big for that. Of course, in the meantime, I threw on more crazy pr projects. The I tried to do the same thing with the uh, Book of Mormon and the Quran. And uh, so I've got more, more to do than I could possibly, <laughs> more than I could possibly manage. Um, but uh, it's been a fun project. And any questions about that or anything you'd like me to talk about it specifically, or I could, I could go on, but. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I was muted and I was talking away. Uh, Sam just realized that you are also the author of Dwindling and Unbelief. Um, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I have a blog that's kind of neglected now. It's, I've always had the difficulty of a, a, whether I'm going to spend time on the blog or whether I'm going to spend time on the website. And what I've, I guess I should kind of update a little bit on the website. When I, when I first created it, um, I, the best I could do is just highlight the crazy, you know, the stuff in the Bible that would be of interest to a skeptic, put it into different categories like cruelties, absurdities, contradictions, uh, conflicts with science, uh, insults to women, you know, all that stuff. So I had like 14, uh, 16 categories that I had things uh, highlighted in, in different color codings with icons and whatnot. And that's kind of the way I went with the with all three of the books, the Bible, Book, uh, book of Mormon, and the Quran. But in the last uh, few years, um, four or five years, I started to re revise the Bible, uh, uh, starting it from the beginning. And now I no longer just have things highlighted, but I'm also trying to summarize the text of the Bible as well. So I have two columns, one column that, which is the text of the Bible and the other is my summary of it. And then, and I also have footnotes down at the bottom that explain contradictions and, and make other uh, snide remarks. Um, and then I, I continued that same uh, format going on to the Book of Mormon and I got through that. Um, and now I'm about two thirds of the way done with the Quran, uh, half to two thirds of the way done with the Quran. So I hope in the next couple months, I'll finish up the Quran. Great. And then when I'm done with that, uh, I plan on pub republishing, putting out a new edition of the, of the SAB, the Skeptics Annotated Bible in the new format. Um, and also I'll do a, the Skeptics Annotated Book of Mormon in book form and then also if i get brave enough the quran yes that does take some bravery that's for sure yeah there's some real danger there i think yeah. maybe, maybe wait till you die <laughs> Published. yeah well it's such an important thing for people know. to know, know about that i i kind of think it's worth the risk but it, it is you know there's some risk there or you could use a pseudonym i could yeah 
Yeah, what's your name? I could use your, your name. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll never spell it anyway. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, let's do that. Megs, you had your hand up to ask a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering with those. Uh, so it's on the web, the skeptics annotated. Any hate mail, threats? How do you fare in that department? You know, not nearly as bad as you'd think. I, I get some, but not too much. Most of it has been fairly um, respectful. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't got a lot of that. Cool. Thanks. Um, did that cover yes. your question? Yeah, that's all I wanted to ask at this point. Okay. Uh, Rick Pearson, you have a question? Yeah. Um, when you start doing the Bible and you start critiquing it, you get all this where you're using the English translation not the original Hebrew or the Old Testament. Right. Doing the Quran, and that's the same problem I found about the Quran because there's like the, what's it called? I don't know, there's various English translations of the Quran. But when you quote that, they're like, well, that's not the true Quran. Oh, you can yeah. only understand it if you speak it. Or I guess it's Arabic. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get that a lot with the Quran, even more with the Quran because the, um, although the, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament isn't written in Hebrew, Nobody really thinks that that God speaks Hebrew exactly. It's it, but He does speak Arabic, and uh, <laughs> and He insists upon it that you cannot translate the Quran into any other language besides Arabic. In fact, if you get a, a, a an English translation, they won't call it a translation. They they'll call it an interpretation um, because it's so delicate to translate into English. But I I think that's all just a just a, a very poor uh, excuse. Um, Exodus uh, 22, 18 is thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And it doesn't matter whether you express that in Hebrew or in English or in any other language, what it means is to kill witches. And there's no context and there's no language that that could be expressed in that, that is um, anything other than kill witches. And the same thing goes for the Quran. I can summarize the Quran pretty much with this phrase, with this sentence. And for the uh, disbelievers, Allah has prepared a painful doom. <clears throat> That's repeated hundreds of times in the Quran. And it's basically the, the message of the Quran. If you are a disbeliever, the, the hell is poorly defined. In fact, it doesn't really exist in the Old Testament much, kind of a Christian invention. But because the Quran came after the New Testament, it accepted, it, it took on the, uh, the Christian idea of hell, and it gave flesh to it. So now, not only is, is, is hell a very real thing in the Quran, it's, it's described in detail, where hooks will be put into your body, and you'll be, your, your flesh will be roasted off, and then it'll be put back on again, and then you'll be roasted off again, and, and then people will be making fun of you as you're suffering. It's, it's really a nasty thing in the Quran. You don't have a body. Uh, they, yeah, the Quran, you do. You definitely have a body, and you, and it's being tormented forever. Yeah, no question about it. So, Rick, did you have anything else on your on your list of questions? Well, follow up. Um, just what the, the bit of the Quran I've read. Okay, the Old Testament. You can pick all pick it apart and all kinds of problems with it, but it tells a rather linear story yes the quran seems like to be a mishmash of things just yeah. here and plop there and highly repetitive bless yeah you know, they praise oh, for the person yes. verses of everything and it's like a hodgepodge it, it is it, it like really Noah's is story where's noah's story there is no noah's story there's noah here and noah there and yes yeah all, and it does actually have kind of bits and pieces of no of the story of noah's noah's ark and it's different than the bible it contradicts the Bible, um, but it and, and other Bible stories like that. The story of Lot. Lot is one of the big heroes. He's a, he's a prophet in the um, in the Quran, and he's a monster in the Bible. Uh, I mean, a monster in the sense of when in Sodom he offers his virgin daughters to a mob of angel rapers, and then later on he gets drunk and impregnates them. <clears throat> um, but in the you can't say anything about Lot to a Muslim without offending them because 
he is of prophet and prophets are perfect. Mm. But yeah, the, the Quran is a real difficult read. It's very difficult to read. Um, and, uh, you know, when I first did it, I didn't really bother trying to read and understand and be, follow, try to follow whatever little bits of pieces of stories there were. I just kind of highlighted the awful things uh, and, and, and the good things. There's a few things. There's a, there's a few good things in there as well. Um, but um, now that I'm going through it in more detail, it's um, quite interesting. I, I'm, I'm having quite a good time with it because it's pretty entertaining. But it's, it does not follow a, a, any story plan at all. Okay, Rick, did that cover yes. everything for now? Yes. Okay, Meg, you have something else? Yes, yeah, so I just want to mark, uh, I'm with Rick. I follow up with what Rick just said. I, I went to a yard sale and there was a Quran for 25 cents, which I suppose was an act of blasphemy. Should have been at least a book. And um, yeah. I took it home and with both and i got a 25 cent bible i'm a miser <laughs> but i got a lot of pencils and i took a great big magic pink magic marker and started reading the quran trying to make sense of it but mostly i was highlighting those phrases and sentences any chunk of language that said punish exile kill yeah and i'm not looking at the quran it's somewhere around here but i think just guessing from the first 80 pages, which was all I could bear. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks to me like maybe a sixth or one seventh of the text was trying yeah. to stop on somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, boy, I thought Rick, oh, who was just speaking, Rick Pearson? Yeah. Yeah. So what Rick said, I have, thank you, Rick, you assure me on my mind, I could not make sense. It was like the writing of the Quran come. The Bible tells stories, and even if they're long, boring stories or short little stories, they're narrative, very narrative. Whereas the Quran seemed to be some guy standing on a soapbox uttering stuff in random paragraphs. Yeah. So how do the so Steve? How do the experts of uh, experts? <laughs> how do those people who fancy themselves experts of the Bible and the Quran say we should approach these holy texts? Oh, well, I, I think there's a there's a lot of variation on that, except for not so much on the Quran. I think all almost all Mormon commentators would say that the Quran in in Arabic is perfect and and has to be accepted without criticism completely. Much more so than you would have even from a fundamentalist Christian with regard to the Bible. Uh, most biblical scholars and most bi most Bible believers um, will say, well, the Bible is inspired by God, but it's written by people. And, you know, they can be mistaken or they can give different emphasis or, you know, this or that. But there's no, there's no, none of that nuance in the uh, Quran. It's, it's directly from, from God through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, who couldn't even write. Um, you know, into the Quran. Wow. So, Megs, did that cover your questions? Yeah, there? although I'll, I'll just add this. I found it very interesting. I don't have a, I have a pretty weak memory. I'm not, I don't need a caretaker yet, but my whole life, weak memory. And in short, a note to everybody, I find it really interesting if I'm interested in a book or text to pick up a magic marker and select some small aspect of the text. Like, what do they say about gifts? I, I remember having to go through a bunch of literature, on Southern literature in America, outlining in pink, pink magic marker every gift and, and with magic marker so I could see the patterns. And to sometimes the whole thing is too hard to swallow grasp, but you take a square inch of the map and look closely and so much richness of understanding reveals itself. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Meg. Um, I have, before I, I recognize Mr. Peterson, um, and, uh, <laughs> um, I, I do have a question uh, concerning the mixing of fabric. A lot of those old rules in the Old Testament I can understand, but I don't understand why you can't mix fabric types. 
Yeah, I've never understood that either. It's definitely in there. Uh, <laughs> but why? Um, maybe someone else uh, in the group would know that, but I don't. I don't think I've heard a good explanation for that. Okay, Mr. Peterson, unmute, please. There you go. All right, well, uh, greetings to Jordan Williams, first of all. Secondly, um, is there anything at all in the narratives, the religious narratives to which you, that you have examined thus far, including the traditional Christian Bible and the, uh, uh, the Islamic books and, and all, all, all the rest of it, is there anything in there that gives you a clue as to how on earth we ever evolved a, uh, a secular humanistic uh, point of view at all in our civilization. And number two here, uh, is there anything in the narratives that to which you've been exposed that you think might contribute positively to some sort of a, of a, um, a humanistic narrative um, that, that what would, would include recognizable decency? Yeah, good questions. The, the second one's a little easier, I think. Um, <clears throat> there's definitely material in, in, in the Bible, um, more so than the other two books, I think, mm -hmm. that ha have some good, good general advice for humans and their humanistic values. Um, for instance, Leviticus 19.18 is, thou shalt <clears throat> love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, th that's, that's good advice. It's good now. It was good then. It'll always be good. Um, the, the, and it does form a big part of the Bible. That, 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 they, that idea is, is not just there, but it was something that, that Jesus spoke a lot about. And um, it's a real part of the, uh, of the Bible. It's, a, it's harder to find that in the uh, Book of Mormon, and it's almost impossible to find it in the Quran. Um, the, the best I can do with the Quran is it does say that you should, there are places where it says things like you should um, be kind to your family. Um, you should pay what they call the poor due. I think it's called the zakat, which is um, you, basically a tax that, pay, that helps poor people. And that's a nice idea, I think. Um, but I try to highlight the good, the good things in the Bible and in each of those books. And with the Bible, at least, you can come up with, you could come up with a pretty good sized pamphlet. Um, with, with, the, with the Book of Mormon, you'd be, you'd be pushed to get more than a page or two. And with the Quran, you could fit it all in a, in a, in a couple sentences, really. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, and then with the Bible, the problem is when you take Leviticus 19.18, in the next chapter, it commands you to execute homosexuals. You know, Leviticus 20.13 says that you must kill homosexuals. Leviticus 20.14 says that if a man has sex with his mother, with his, with his, uh, with his wife and her mother, then you have to burn all three. Um, so... Even though there's some good stuff, it's you know you really have to look for it um, in in the Bible. So there's that, and then the other question was with how did we ever get it? Was it what if I understood it right? Was it how did we ever find any humanistic values at all when we were so immersed in superstition and superstition? Yeah, I, I would guess a, a major history lesson would be in order to understand that, but. You know, how, it seems uh, pretty impossible to get from there to here with a lot yeah. of this stuff. Yeah, I, I, you know, when you look at, I, I kind of, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Steven Pinker's um, Better Angels of, of our, uh, book, and then he has another one on the Renaissance, uh, Renaissance Now, I think. In that book, he chronicles how, the, how um, humanity has um, managed to struggle through and basically um, achieve some sort of humanity, some some sort of some some good good values um, through history, with you know ups and downs, but kind of generally making some progress in that direction. 
and I'm not sure I have it. I have an explanation as for why that would be, but I, I think it's probably just that we kind of muddled our way through finding things that seem to kind of work and rejecting those things that don't. Well, and that, anyway, that, that's, well, I don't have a good answer. What? Did that answer your questions, Jim? You found a pistachio yeah. from the ground. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dennis? Quiet, quiet. Dennis? Hi, hi there, I'm here. Um, okay. You were talking about not mixing the fabrics and it occurs to me, it reminds me of old American Westerns where you'd have a war between the sheep herders and the, and the ranchers. And my suspicion is that in the ancient times, sheep would come through the cotton fields and cause all kinds of chaos. So they didn't want to mix that. Uh, the other thing is I got about a third of the way through the Quran once and had to stop because I ran across one of the surahs that every other statement was alternatingly, God doesn't care what you do. God is watching everything you do. God doesn't care what you do. And back and forth and back and forth. And my final question is, um, I talked to someone who was convinced that the Quran had never been modified from the time that Muhammad originally wrote it. And what do you have any opinions on its consistency over centuries? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I mean, I've seen, I've seen some, um, some criticism of that idea that there have been changes. I'm pretty sure that there have been changes in the Quran, particularly in, this, in the early century or two after, uh, after Muhammad. Um, the the uh, origin of the Quran and the and the uh, also the life of Muhammad and the and the teaching of Muhammad the uh, acts of Muhammad the the Sunnah is all um, in fact even the existence of Muhammad is is a little bit questionable most of these most of this uh, most of the 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 knowledge about evidence for the Quran um, and for Muhammad were uh, several generations after Muhammad supposedly lived. So I think it's all pretty sketchy. Um, similarly for Jesus and, and you know, that information about Jesus and, and also the changes in the, um, in the docu the, uh, the Christian uh, and, and biblical texts as well, you know, have sort of the same problems of, of copyist errors and that sort of thing. I suspect you have the same thing with the Quran. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Megs, you have something else? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say, oh, I put a title in chat. I'm not sure if it went out. Talking to, in response to what uh, Jim Peterson said, how do we ever wake up? How do the hordes ever wake up? Anyway, there's a video, you can see it on YouTube, came out maybe 15, 20 years ago. Three-part video series by Jay. The History of Disbelief, produced, I believe, by the BBC. And it's a wonderful glimpse, beautiful oh. to watch. And interesting, Jason Miller is talking about the history of belief. And half of the episodes have been filmed in churches with giant stained glass windows behind them. It's beautiful, but it's illuminating. It talks about disbelief from about 700, 800 BC up to maybe to the time the video was done. I want to say, and I want to say Frank Boas, talk about the population throwing off beliefs. I believe it was Frank Boas, the anthropologist and a couple of his cohorts who escaped me right now, argued that in most of the societies they studied, everybody would, the herd would go along, but there's usually about seven to 10% of black sheep who are just grumpy and skeptics. <laughs> so you should all be here wearing your black sheepskin, just skeptics. Every culture produces them. And it might not be that they're skeptics, but indeed every culture, every institution big enough blah, blah, has people that can't help but see reality. They can't go along with the bubbles and the fantasy. And it's often a deep inconvenience to them, but those are the people who kick us forward another three inches or a mile. But there are people who insist on telling the truth, or at least saying, I don't believe that. 
they don't necessarily, there are people who tell the truth in spite of them. I'll just add this. I, I work for a giant corporation, digital, that was laying off 500 people a week. And um, a lot of politics in this giant corporation as things are going. And I worked with many different departments inside the corporation. One of the fascinating things I saw, there were people in, in big important meetings who could not go along with management. And they weren't, some of them were grouch. They, there are just people who are compelled to tell the truth, kind of like kleptomaniacs are compelled to steal. Some people are compelled to eat ice cream. There are people compelled to tell the truth. And it's an, it's an interesting phenomenon. But if you're a truth teller, you're in for trouble and you, can't, you often can't stop yourself. So that's where those people come from, the, the disagreeables, the skeptoids and the, sorry, I got a twitch, got a truth twitch, hard to live with. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Meg. So um, other, I, I'm curious about the Book of Mormon. Uh -huh. um, I've known a number of Mormons. I've worked with a number of Mormons. Um, yeah. Very, some very, uh, some of the people I worked with were very smart and yet they. Yes, yeah. And, and the same is true of Scientology. I'm in Florida. I live near the, the huge Scientology Center. So we, we talk about them frequently. Um, the, the crazy stuff that they, they uh, believe. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I'm sorry, I can't formulate a question about Mormons, but how does, you said that the Mormon Bible had even less than, or the more Book of Mormon had even less um, stuff in it that was positive. Mm -hmm. Bible. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think that's true. That one, of the, one of the reasons for that is that the Book of Mormon is a story. You know, the Bible has stories in it, but it also has some just some basic uh, more more preaching type stuff um, where you would tend to get some some um, just kind of general advice type things. Whereas in the in the Book of Mormon, it's a story. And the, and the main thing is about the Book of Mormon is it's a very, very silly story. You know, it, it, from, from a modern perspective, you know, it's one that made a lot of sense in the early 19th century because everyone was wondering at the time, where did all the Indians come from? Yeah. There were all these mounds that people saw all over the place. There were places where there were garbage piles that they were made mounds and they, they'd be pour, looking through those and finding, finding, um, um, treasures in those little mounds and wondering about the where the Indians came from, especially when you, because you had the creation going on over in the old world and then somehow they got here. Well, Joseph Smith had the answer to that. They, they, they sailed over here, you know, in, in, in a barge uh, in 600 BC. Well, actually they did it several times. They had several different, uh, <laughs> several different groups that came over, but one of them came over during after the, the Tower of Babel, like, more than 2000 BC. Um, but that Joseph Smith answered a question that people were really wondering about at the time. So he came up with this rather elaborate story. It's mostly a bunch of wars between the good ones, good people and the bad people, uh, the good Indians and the bad Indians. The good Indians were um, um, the, the ones that, um, well, they, were, they all started off nice and white skinned. But then their skins were turned dark because they they rebelled against uh, Nephi, uh, you know, the, the kind of the chosen guy, the good guy, and so God turned their skins dark, and He made them into savages, naked savages, and they ended up killing all the white guys, and then they buried the plates and Joseph Smith, the histories, they wrote everything on these plates, and Joseph Smith dug it up and pretty much in his backyard, about nine, three miles away from his home, from his family farm. And that's the Book of Mormon, you know? And so it's just, it's a silly story. So it's, when you have a silly story like that, it's hard to, to uh, find places in there to put some good ideas in. Plus, I don't think Joseph Smith was real big on good ideas anyway. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty uh, corrupt. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, he must have been, he must have been the most charismatic person that, you know, at least in that century. 
just an, must have been an amazing character because he was such a young man and unschooled and people would just follow him w wherever and whatever he said or did. Yes, yes, interestingly enough. But it's a horrible book. Uh, uh, Tom, um, um, Mark Twain said that it was uh, chloroform in print. Um, <laughs> He said that if you were to take all the and, and it came to passes out of the Book of Mormon, it would be nothing more than a pamphlet. And, that, okay. and, and it's true. Uh, you know, the, the Bible has a lot of and it came to passes. Probably about 5% of its verses start with and it came to pass. But in the Book of Mormon, it's more like 25% of the verses start with and it came to pass. I don't know whether he did it just for filler purpose. I think he did it for two reasons. One is that it added a few words, uh, so it made his book a little longer, just like a kid who's trying to make his thousand word essay. And uh, the other reason is that it made it sound more biblical. True, true. Uh, Megs, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Yeah, question to Mr. Wells. So you did all this deep and careful reading. So is there anyone, portrayed in the Bible, the Mormon, the Quran, anyone for whom you developed a good feeling? Who did you admire who's worthwhile? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, there are characters in, in, the, in the Book of Mormon in particular, but also in the Bible, who are um, hero, heroes. Um, I'm, trying, I'm having a little trouble right now thinking of their names. Um, <clears throat> but in the Book of Esther, um, the queen, um, there was a queen who refused to dance pretty much naked in front of her, the king's uh, drunken uh, guests. Um, what's her and name again? Vashti. Yeah, Vashti. Uh, she would be, a, I think she would be a her heroine in the, in the Bible. Uh, of, course, of course, she lost, she, you know, she was banned and uh, she lost, she wasn't queen anymore after that. And Esther took over, but she would be a hero. And then in the Book of Mormon, there were several free thought her heroes. Uh, Cory Hor was one. And um, there were several that said, you know, what you're, what you're telling people is a bunch of bunk and you know it, you know. Um, and uh, of course, they, they all ended up being punished um, in various ways for, you know, they weren't, they, they're not presented as heroes. But to me, they come across that way. So there are some characters like that uh, in the in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. There's nothing in the in the Quran that I know of uh, that I would say there's a heroic person in the Quran. Thank you. Thank you. And and, and Jesus in his good in his good moods, you know, is, <laughs> would be one. <laughs> On a good day. On a good day, but you know he could he could be he could be awful on you know when he was having a bad day. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. Eileen. Yeah, I just wondered: Do the uh, Mormons do they go out and evangelize? Like, do they try to get people to join the church? Because when I was out west, I had uh, met some Mormons and. Uh, a couple of the fellows, one of those missions where I think two, they, they go out on missions for some reason and then they travel around and then they go back. But they hardly ever talked. They would, it was like sort of, they kept to themselves. They don't really kind of, they didn't want to talk to anybody that was outside of their religion. I don't know if that's that's uh, typical or is that just my experience with uh, this couple of guys that I, I took them on a, a, a horse ride outside because the people that owned the ranch were Mormons. So I took them out to show them where to go. And I don't know, they, they just did not speak at all to me, but maybe because yeah. I was not a, a Mormon. I don't know. I, I, I just, may, 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 it might be because they knew too much about you. What, <laughs> what, I mean, what I mean by that is that they might know that you would be skeptical and you're, you wouldn't be a, a, a good um, a candidate for, uh, for belief. Uh, so, that's true of almost all religions. They they pick on the weak and the and the helpless and the and um, the desperate. And you may not have 
seemed that way to, to them enough, so they might leave you alone. I, I lived in Pocatello for, in fact, for a long, large part of the time. When I started doing this project, I lived in Pocatello, which is about almost half Mormon, and Pocatello, Idaho. And um, so, and I worked in a company where there were an, an awful lot of Mormons, but I don't think I've ever had one of them approach me and try to convert me. But I think that's because everybody kind of knew, you know, but yeah, do they? Yeah, they go door to door. They send missionaries out all over the world. It's, it's, they really push it hard, but they are, I think they're kind of careful. They don't waste their ammo, you know? <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying, because the experience I had with them is I was trying, I was supposed to be showing them where to go and where to come back. And it was getting dark and there was a rattlesnake that was, uh, rattling ahead and I took my horse and went up on because I knew how to get around it and these two fools wouldn't even follow me you know I mean and so my horse was like wanted to join back and and you know in other words they they didn't even wouldn't even reply to me when I said hey there's a snake let's go up this way they just kept going and well luckily they the, their horse didn't get bit but you know I'm just saying that they were the maybe they didn't want to speak to a woman that they didn't know I have no idea but it was it was that really stuck out in my mind that they didn't even reply when I said, you know, that we've got to go another way. They just kept going. But yeah. Yeah, well, maybe they don't follow women either. You know? <laughs> it, it, yeah, I think there's a little bit of that probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be. Well, like I said, they survived. So I guess they were right. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eileen. I, uh, the, the people want to, one of the people I worked with was from the reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they were, uh, he was extremely adamant that they were not like regular Mormons. They weren't the same as regular Mormons. They were different. So it's, they, I don't know. It's amazing how much things splinter. Yeah, well, you know, you know how that happened, um, at least my understanding of that is that when Joseph Smith died, they didn't have anybody to su succeed him. And so they, he did have a son, but he was young. He was only like, I don't know, 12 years old or something at the time. And so some followed the son and then some followed Brigham Young. And Brigham Young, young you know, ended up getting the, the vast majority of them went with Brigham Young and the, and the rest of them went with the son and that became the reorganized, reorganized church of Latter-day Saints. I believe. Uh, I'm not sure. And uh, um, I was going to say, Sam has put in to the uh, chat uh, a link to your uh, blog spot on who has killed more Satan or God, and um, that you've written this wonderful page on this um, on Lucifer kills versus Bible deity kills. Yeah, I, I, I should probably also mention that I ended up. Uh, creating a book out of that, um, Drunk with Blood, God's Killings in the Bible, <clears throat> uh, where I go through all the killings in the Bible that God either did himself or told people to do or at least approved of. And there's a lot. And someone mentioned in the chat, I saw that, that Satan would be one of the heroes of the Bible as close as you'd get. And I, and I would I would agree with that. He, he's, a, he's a very minor character. You know, he doesn't show up much. Right. But when he does, he kind of challenges God a little bit. Like he said, uh, like with Job, he says, God, say, God says, hey, look at my guy Job down there. He's such a good guy. He does whatever I say. And uh, Satan says, yeah, yeah, he does. You give him everything. You know, he's got it. You, but you take away his stuff and he'll curse you to your face. And that was kind of a, um, you know, it's pretty wise uh, on his part. Yeah. Um Joe Reinhardt, you asked. Uh, yes, um, I just got here, so I, I may have missed it, but Judas uh, is one of the main heroes of yes, the Bible. Yes, yes, I agree with that, yeah. If it weren't for him, uh, God's plan for salvation uh, would never have happened. So we owe a lot to Judas, who, who committed suicide for his efforts or hanged himself. Yeah, and, and also, um, <laughs> he also... Um, <laughs> challenged Jesus when uh, the when the woman was was spending all that fans uh, that money on the uh, anointing his feet with that very precious oil mm -hmm. uh, he said you know that money could be used for the poor 
Um, he, you know, so he, there, there were things that, Jesus, that Judas said that were, whenever he spoke, whenever he, he spoke, he kind of said some wise and uh, kind things. I, I don't know if you've ever read um, Asimov's uh, book on the Bible uh, when he, he his um, thing on Judas was that it was a, a mistranslation or a, a typo kind of thing, a, a, um, a writing error that he was actually part of a, it wasn't uh, Judas of Iscariot, but Judas Iscariot or something like that, which was a rebel group among the Christians. Um, I thought that was interesting. Joe, did you have anything else you wanted to ask or comment on? Um, no, other than I've, I've never heard the alternate uh, uh, Judas uh, theory before, but um, either way, we, we owe him a lot. Yeah. Apparently. Not that I think any of those people actually lived. Well, he gave up eternity to save us uh, again so that uh, Jesus could be tortured and. Uh, God's plan for our salvation, such as it is, could be put into effect. You mean yeah. you just had a really bad weekend for us? No, I mean that, that God's plan for our salvation has sucks from the beginning, not just from Jesus' standpoint, but from our standpoint. Yeah, you know, yeah you're right. You, that's the best you could come up with, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will tell you that Joe is our resident Bible expert. So. Oh, hardly. <laughs> No, you are. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Meg, you had your hand up, took it down. You had something else? Yeah, uh, yeah I did because I saw a Jim and other people because I've asked a lot. I didn't want to be a time hog, but I'll squeeze in. So, Steve, now you, what do you spend or when you're working on this? An hour, five hours a day working on the text. And so here's why I asked. I've, in the last five years, I've been what I've binged a couple different subjects. A true crime drama reenactment, which started making me paranoid. Uh, I started reading a bunch of really crummy, violent novels. I started, it really disturbed or colored my thoughts all day long. So this reading, this close reading you've been doing, did it perturb your mind or just fill it any different? I'm really interested in how our brains respond and our conceptualization. So did you get too much God and Ismail in your head? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I feel like the, uh, the, I've, the, the Bible really isn't my interest. Um, I, I, have a, I have another website that I, that I have, which is called uh, Life on a Quarter Acre, where I try to document all the living things that I have that I've found on my, uh, on my little quarter acre lot here. Wow. Um, so, so it's like go oh, 350 different insects and um, and, and, and I, I'm more interested in that. I'm really more of a naturalist than I am a uh, I'm certainly not a Bible scholar, but yeah. I'm uh, but I I keep coming back to it because I feel like it's something that it could have an effect on on someone. I mean, a positive effect. Um, so I, I feel like since I kind of have that platform that you know, after spending so much time on it, it's out there, I have to keep at it, keep with it, because I feel like it's a worthwhile project. And I don't know anyone else who really wants to, I, you know, my, my son, um, I have a son, Philip, who has been very helpful with it. It's kind of, he's kind of my business manager. And he also did uh, a lot of blogging on the, on the uh, Quran, kind of blogged his way completely through the Quran. I mean, not through the, through the Book of Mormon, that is. Oh, right. And I used his material a lot when I uh, redid, when I revised the uh, Book of Mormon. But still, I don't have anybody that I can really hand it off to. And so I feel like it's a, it's a project that I have to see through as much as I can to its completion, no matter how distasteful, um, <laughs> you know, the content of the Bible, actually, not, not just the Bible, but those books. If, if someone were to ask me what are the worst three books that I've ever read, it, it would be the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. I, now, if, which of those is the worst is a tougher one. I, I think I would say the Quran is the worst book, probably the worst book in the world. It's a, it's a shame that we have a, like 1.3 billion people that base their lives upon it. But Quran, I think, would be the worst. And in terms of the most, the silliest book that's ever been written would have to be 
the, the uh, Book of Mormon would be would be close. Um, I think the Bible probably is is more is at least as harmful as the other two. Probably the most the most harmful book might have been the Bible on our civilization. Wow. But I don't I don't know. They certainly are some horrible books. But I, I spend all my time on them. It's kind of sad. In fact, I'm going to stick a quick question here. Have you had any exposure to the what are the two books of Jew, the, from the Jewish world, Torah, Talmud? Any exposure, commentate on those? Well, the Torah is just the first five books of the Bible. So, yeah, oh, okay. the Torah. The Talmud is the uh, writing of the rabbis. And, and uh, that is something that uh, I haven't spent any time on. And I don't, I don't plan on it. It's just too big of an <laughs> undertaking. <laughs> it's sort of like trying to do the Sunnah uh, in, in Islam. I'm, I'm not going to mess with that. I am going to do the Doctrine and Covenants, covenants in the Book of Mormon. That's one of my next projects. Um, cool. And uh, but that I think that I think that's going to be it. When I get the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price uh, done, I'll probably have gone through all the. I'm, I'm going to leave the. Um, I'm not sure I can pronounce it even. Bhagavad Gita or whatever it is. I, I'm going to leave that one alone. Even though it's very short and it could be done quickly, I'll probably, I probably won't, won't tackle that one. Okay, thank you, Max. Um, I'm, Jim, I'm gonna go to Larry since he hasn't asked a question yet and then come back to you. So, um, Larry Silverman. You have a question? need to unmute if you're asking your question. Okay. Um, well, I, should, I should say that I've been asked to do the Iran ship book, but I'm not gonna do that either. <laughs> uh, Jim Peterson, you wanna go ahead? All right, I'm here. And um, yes, I, uh, I, I was just wondering if you think that Jesus was affiliated with the uh, Judean People's Front or the People's Front of Judea? That uh, seems to be a good <laughs> question. <laughs> but uh, uh, on a more serious note, though, it is interesting that, um, as I noted before, so much of Western civilization has been brought to us through these various religions. If it weren't for the Islamic scholars who initially copied yeah. and recopied uh, the Greek philosophers, we would have precious little knowledge of them today. And, and certainly they were uh, great facilitators of uh, real civilization, the beginnings yep. of science and so forth. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's, I think, something about religion, and I suspect it has to do with grammar, because grammar has rules and syntax and so forth. And uh, consequently, uh, uh, when, when you put a lot of gibberish together, eventually you'll come up with contradictions. You'll come up with uh, logical fallacies of many kinds, and all of which will be noticed and require resolution. And it's through these requirements over many years or even centuries that I believe that a lot of um, religions uh, tend to gradually uh, uh, morph into uh, something like a much more rigorous study until eventually it, uh, it kind of undermines itself. And I think that the work that you're doing, Steve, is very important in helping uh, uh, people, ordinary people, understand the transition and the, and the importance of, of, of religion itself as a basis, but also as a way of seeing the distance from which we have come. I, I congratulate you on your work. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, Larry, we're willing to try again if you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Okay. Well, if you decide, does anybody else have a question, Mr. O'Keefe, or? Um, Tom or Scott or Sam, you don't have any questions? You put comments in there. Um, 
Um, yeah, I won, I guess. Yeah, I'm based on okay. two. This is my first time, so. Um, the Bible, uh, I don't know if I can, let me share, uh, open my camera. I have this chart with me. Let me try to see this chart or something. So they say that, ah, that is I'm sorry, we're having a real trouble uh, hearing you. Yeah, can, can you see this chart? Oh. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, so this, this chart basically says that um, uh, by the uh, the create the planet was created on 4004 BC, and pretty much uh, many Christians kind of agree with that. So, but they, we have a lot of artifacts that are carbon dated 6000 BC. So, um, like, what? How? Like, uh, again, I don't know how Christians justify that, but you probably know how they do that. So, do you know what they say and how? why we have artifacts that are older than 4,000 BC? Yeah, well, um, they're, they're, they're kind of stuck with the 4,000 BC, although there's a lot of debate, you know, Bishop Usher came up with the 4,004 BC thing, and uh, it used to be printed in Bibles a lot, and so you'll still hear that today, but Different groups, different um, <clears throat> Christian groups have different uh, dates of creation, um, and some some are some will go back to you know tens of thousands of years, and some will even admit uh, millions of years, and some will go say that it could be billions of years. You know that they, they will they won't uh, have any problem with the current with evolution and the and the modern uh, understanding of uh, of um, the history of life and the history of the solar system and the universe. So there's so much var variety on that that it's, it's hard to um, generalize. But certainly there is a large group of uh, more fundamentalist or evangelical Christians that sort of settle on a something close to a 6,000 year uh, uh, creation where creation occurred about 6,000 years ago, something like that. And that's all based upon the genealogies of the patriarchs in, in the Bible, uh, mostly. Very difficult to get to. I, I'm not sure it can actually it can actually be done. I've never tried. It can, you can get back to the flood, I think. Um, but well, it's 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 diff to, difficult to get an actual uh, number on it. Joe Reinhardt is just champing at the bit to get in. Oh, just a little sideline. He mis mentioned Bishop Usher who was able to nail down the exact day uh, that God began creating the earth. Not only that, he started about 9 a.m. in the morning. Yes, that's right. On October 12th or something, I don't know, yeah, 22nd. 4,000 and something. Uh, BC. 4,004 BC, yeah. yeah. yeah Bishop yeah, Usher. That, that's really amazing. That, pretend to know things that can't be known. That's, that, is, uh, that is incredible to be so precise. That's, yeah. You deserve some kind of award on that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Jehovah's Witnesses have their own date. Uh, I think it's 4,026 uh, BC and everybody's got it. That's why they came up with, they thought the world was going to end, uh, Armageddon was going to happen in 1975 because uh, creation happened in, everybody seems to think that because a day is a thousand years to uh, God, that if you have once, once this, the year 6,000 is over, then you've got your six days over and then you're going to have the thousand years of after Armageddon and all that. So yeah, they all have that. It's all biblical ba biblically based, but it's the Bible just doesn't come out and say, you know, this is when creation occurred. If, if a day is a thousand years uh, to the Almighty, how do you account for the Sabbath? Uh, Sunday's I mean, a thousand. We could only take one day off every 7,000 years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I guess that's that's kind of how they. I guess that's why they uh, think that it's going to be. Uh, it all has to happen on the beginning of the seventh day because that would be the Sabbath. I, I don't. I don't get why there'd be this magical thing about a thousand years. Uh, they, they're making it up as they go along. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dennis, you have a question. Sorry, there. I got my mic on. I just wanted to share a couple of lines from a new episode of the TV series, The Orville. Uh, new Horizons is the third season. And there were a couple of comments by characters that said, all religions are confusing. 
how do you think the priests stay in business? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, what's his name? Um, Seth McFarland is um, a an out atheist. He also yeah. did the plasma too. So. Yes. Uh, Megs, you have a question? You need to unmute, Megs. Um, Steve Wells. So somebody, I just realized, somebody here earlier mentioned charisma. Now, Steve, how many different Bibles or Book of Mormons were you looking at? Physical copies. Because I know, I was thinking charisma, so many gargantuanly successful preachers over the centuries would get congregations of 10 or 20,000, even in 1400, because they were so beautiful and had such wonderful voices. You go into a church in the stained glass, and God, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. I want to eat my pizza there. So how about you and the text? Did you get tired of looking at Gothic or reading Pica 10 point Bibles? Do you think you were influenced by that at all? The gorgiousity of the text, of the uh, just the printing, the prettiness. Well, you know, I don't really find anything attractive about the Bible, to be honest. I mean, nothing from the the. It's um, I find it a very frustrating book. Um, even if you even if you take it seriously, or the more you take it seriously, the more frustrating it is because. You know, it was written by so many different doc, uh, authors at so many different times, and they all contradict each other. Um, a lot of it's pretty boring. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree with you as far as like church architecture. So something I really miss about the Catholic Church is the, is the ritual and the architecture and um, the, um, um, the tradition, you know. Um, yeah, it's like a special kind of opera. Hey, this is pretty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, the music, you know, there, there's a lot about the uh, Catholicism and, and the, the, all that stuff that was developed in the Middle Ages that I find very appealing. In fact, I, I, the monastic life is something that I, I, I could be a monk. You know, I wanted to be a monk and wow. I could still be a monk. I think the idea of a secular monastery is an exciting thing to me. I mean, I, I, if I were a young man, I'd be interested in doing that. Uh, so there are aspects to religious life, meditation, uh, even prayer in a, in a, in a more uh, meditative sort of thing, contemplative thing. There's a lot of aspects to re religious life and um, to um, the um, uh, religious traditions that I think are valuable and worth preserving. And I, I, I think that we need to recapture some of that as uh, secularists. Boy, that's but, a wonderful thought. But the, but the thought. Bible wouldn't be one of them. Yeah. You know, that's a wonderful thought of writing up. Secular monasteries. Well, I yeah. guess I, I have a couple of friends who go off for long Buddhist retreats. Yes, yeah. yes. We have one here just a few miles away. I haven't gone to it, but it, it that type of thing would really appeal to me uh, to have a, a, like secular retreats and ha to have uh, actual full-blown secular monasteries where people were really trying to learn and understand the, the world. Wow. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Meg. Um, Joe Reinhardt? Uh, yes, uh, Steve, uh, have you ever been in jail? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> that, that, that's a secular, that's a secular uh, um, monastery waiting for you anytime you need it. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I have some firsthand knowledge on that subject and I can tell you that that's, uh, I never want to get any closer to a monastery or to jail than I've ever been before, period, ever. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I've, I've been in a monastery before. I've lived in a monastery. I lived with the Carmelites for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's a little different than a jail, but well, I lived with the convicts, uh, and uh, uh, it's a monastic life. Uh, and again, if being in a monastery is anything like that, I'm not even the least bit interested. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I agree with you there. Thank you, Joe. <laughs>
and I'm sure there's a, there's a lot of uh, of the um, I'm probably I probably look at monastic life at, within a little a little bit too romantically because when I was a when I wanted to be a, a, when I was a young man and that that appealed to me um, I was unwilling to look at it in in any critical way at all it was it, so and I haven't really thought about it since. Brent, do you have a question? Well, I was just going to say, uh, when he says ro looked at it too romantically, uh, that has a different uh, different uh, connotation when you're talking about a Catholic monastery. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, and, and that's really kind of something new that, um, I mean, new relatively in the, in the last two or three decades. Um, when I when I was thinking about being a monk, I had never even heard of any of that. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I think it probably did. Oh yeah, it did. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. But um, I that I'll just say that that wasn't what I was interested in, or that isn't something that I knew anything about. I think there is a positive aspect to it, and and I think that it, that positive aspect is still uh, is still something that that can be admired. Thank you, Brent. Did that response cover your comment, question? Yeah, and I, I assume you're talking about, about uh, the uh, retreat aspect, not the uh, molestation of kids. Well, of course, yes. You know, I'm, I'm talking about study. I'm talking about learning. I'm talking about contemplation, uh, meditation, um, the uh, like a writer's retreat. The, the the ordered life that the that a, that a, that a monk would live, um, all of that. The um, the 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 mo monastery that I I was interested in was was hermits, and so as a hermit, you certainly wouldn't get involved too much with um, um, with with any of the sexual stuff. So, thank you, Brent. Um, <clears throat> I have a question for you, Steve. In terms of um, we, we frequently have this argument that the Bible cannot teach you morals, um, but I, and that religion itself does no good. And I'm wondering, um, I, I, I certainly agree that the Bible can't teach you morals because it's outrageous. But do you think in, in your studies that you've seen any kind of really good things that have come out of religion? Oh yeah, I, I I don't think there's any question that uh, that there have that good things have come out of religions. I think hospitals, schools, um, uh, I mean, I, I think the church probably gets more credit than that than maybe they deserve. But there's some aspect to it that that they there has been involved. The church has been involved with some charitable charitable educational. Um, uh, and health related activities that I think have been helpful. I also think that there's a tendency that, that religion can, can make people better in the sense that the, you, the motivation can be stronger when you, um, it, it, Christianity is very, it, it, if you look at it in its very best light, can inspire you to uh, love your neighbor and to try to work toward their uh, toward their well-being, and I think it can help people to do that. I'm not recommending it. I'm not saying that that justifies it. I'm, I don't. I think that even though, even if even if you could be a better person by believing false things, I still think it's wrong to do that. That that the truth is it, the truth is of the most importance, and we can't sac we can't just we can't just believe something because we think it will either it either will make us happy or it'll make us better people. We have to believe something because we think it's true. So, so I'm, I'm not an ad, but I do think that the religion has inspired people to do good things. I think it's also inspired pe people to do horrible things, like fly planes into buildings and and have uh, the crusades and horrible religious wars and on and on and on. I'm not saying that it's. I'm not even saying that that uh, on balance it would be good. I'm just saying that it is a mixed bag. 
it has inspired people. To, I think it has inspired people to do good things, but it's also inspired probably more wrong things. And I think for us to survive, if, if we're going to survive the next few generations, the only way we will do it is if we're able to abandon the superstitious superstitions of our past, hmm. uh, which would include all religions. Well, the, the problem I have, like with the hospitals, uh, where I live in Tampa, almost every hospital is run by uh, religion. Mm -hmm. either Catholics or uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they use it as a recruiting tool in a sense that if, 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 if you're healed, it's because God wanted you healed rather than because the doctors right. did their job or yeah. you know, science has kept up with them. Yeah. No, I, I think that religion shouldn't have anything to do with health today. That I, I, I would be opposed to, to any hospital being run by a religious institution, and they certainly should get no public money. And they for do. That. I know they do. And that, that really upsets me because now they're getting the credit, the, the credit for helping people in the hospital when it's really coming through the, um, the, um, the people, not the, not yes. the church. Yes. Okay, Megs, you had something else? Oh yeah, to follow up with Steve. Yeah, a lot of charities that are well praised are getting their money through the faith-based initiative. Mm -hmm. Look, they're feeding the poor. Close parent silent with the American taxpayer money funneled through the White House, close parent. But what I did wanna say uh, about the good that many religions do, I, I finally realized that yes, so one of the great advantages, the long lived religions, Christian, Buddhist, especially the Catholic church in my experience, you know, gearing up has served as like a trellis for civilization, art, music, literature, and book publishing. One of the shocks to me is it turned out history is full of army A, conquer one country conquers another. And not only do they take the gold, but they enslave the people, burn the libraries and change the language. And I didn't realize how common that was. Any conqueror just wiped out the culture of the conquered. But the church and in some institutions managed to survive and flourish conqueror after conqueror. And I think the Catholic church and Buddhism uh, are like that, and I think they have both brought about good things. I can't say the same for Islam because contemporary Islam is so limiting. But then like I think Steve said, yeah, back in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, the Arab world committed could, contributed so much. But I find it useful to think of the Catholic church and the ilk as long lived trellises upon which culture could grow. Not that the church intended that, but <laughs> a happy, what we well, call a happy spinoff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, perhaps you could name uh, one thing that uh, the church has inspired, like the beautiful art and the stained glass windows and great buildings that couldn't have been inspired by a secular person. Could Michelangelo paint any better or any worse? whether he believed in God uh, or the bunny rabbit, right? or the Easter bunny, excuse me. I, I can't think of one example, maybe you could. Uh, also, uh, and that's just a statement, not really a question. Uh, I, and I propose that many of the services like feeding the poor, et cetera, uh, that the churches provide wouldn't be necessary if they pay their taxes. Um, other people could provide those even better. And lastly, I wanted you to comment on the, uh, advice of the Bible to love your enemy. Is that a good idea? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 that is one I, that I struggle with when I'm trying to identify the good things in the Bible. Is that a good idea? I, I think I might have it marked as good, but it, if I do, it's with misgivings because it's not at all clear to me that that's a good thing. Well, why would you want to reward someone for doing you a disservice or for being a danger to your life or, or property or, or your family? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or being a danger to society or, or, or anything. Yeah. 
No, I, I agree. I don't, I don't think that the turn the other cheek, uh, the uh, love your enemy is, is, is clearly a good thing. What I will say is it's, it's, it's remarkable to, to have had someone say something like that 2000 years ago, um, mm. just because it seemed so out of place. It was one of the things I think when I read the gospels that made me kind of believe it is that how could anybody that lived at that time say such audacious things? You know, I mean, that those are just, they, they, they're kind of crazy in a good way, right? I mean, it's taking something, taking a good idea to an extreme where it becomes maybe no longer good, but it, it is a it 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 is a strange thing that um, that some of the sayings of Jesus seem so kind of modern. You know, I, I here I am. I'm being an apologist now. You know, so we're all going to believe in Jesus now. But anyway, you're having shape in life. No, I, I think Jesus gets too much credit. You know, um, it, it, among among uh, even non-believers, but. Um, there's there's probably some good ideas that are here and there. Does it fall? I, I'm that, not sure loving your neighbor is a good one. Does it fall into that keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Linda Faulkner. Um, I was thinking Michelangelo didn't exactly have a choice. He was required to paint religious. And had he had the option, he might have done some very beautiful secular work as well. Yeah, but, but it was also true that um, the um, church was the only one to had any money because they confiscated all the land. That's why the, the you know, and they, they took money from people. Um, so they were the only ones who could afford to hire artists. Had they not been around, I'm sure he would have painted and he would have painted differently than he did and we'll never know what he would right. have or could have done. And well, look, at, look at modern artists. We have all, Salvador Dali uh, didn't have a religious uh, sponsor. He's pretty well known. Picasso made himself a billionaire uh, without the aid of uh, any celestial being. Yeah, I'm not sure Picasso is the best person to hold up. He's <laughs> great. Uh, Jim Peterson. You're muted, Jim. Yes, I know. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, I, I hate to, to take issue with anything that Joe says because he's usually right. But in this case, I would, I would have to say that, um, um, that the church, in fact, did make it possible where a lot of the great art or what we regard as great art and works of various kinds, literature, music, architecture, I'm not statuary, everything. Uh, they made that possible because they, uh, they had uh, amassed tremendous wealth and they needed to impress their followers with what great magnificent uh, palaces they were able to construct. In, uh, in, in furtherance of uh, demonstrating uh, the power of their belief system. So, uh, and in, in this, they were largely uh, also uh, in support of and supported by the monarchies and the aristocracy of their time. So all of it came together uh, to form a kind of a unified uh, power structure that incorporated a lot of the, uh, what we would regard as the greatest art that was uh, made during that during that period or during any period for that matter, uh, very expressive and wonderful stuff, but at the same time uh, done at the expense of a more uh, rational approach to life. Uh, we're beginning to uh, get the balance back on that scale a little bit, I think, but uh, much remains to be done. Thanks. Joe, did you want to respond to that? Um, no, um, I, I don't question the fact that, that it was the church and the, uh, the moneyed aristocracy who made uh, uh, art possible uh, for hundreds of years. I don't question that at all. I simply say that the inspiration that they received 
uh, was uh, the same kind of money they would have got from a secular person and that the art they had, would have created would have been just as good without any divine inspiration. That, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Rick O'Keefe? I just wanted to ask Steve if he is at all familiar with George Lamps's New Testament translation from the Aramaic from the Eastern Orthodox Church or his works uh, explaining all the sayings and proverbs from the Aramaic that are so poorly translated in his opinion into modern Bibles, such as the uh, saying more difficult for a rich person to get to heaven than for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle when the Aramaic says more difficult than a rope to go through the eye of a needle, which makes sense to Jewish and Aramaic speakers because that's part of their culture. They understand it. That's my question. Uh, Steve, you're muted. I can't unmute you. I'm oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with uh, with that author, and I am I'm not um, I'm not a I'm not able to read the texts in their original language, uh, so those types of insights would uh, be beyond me. Um, and and I hadn't heard the rope in the eye of the needle thing. I I've I've heard I've heard, I've heard uh, that the uh, Eye of the needle was the entrance into a um, through a, a hole in a wall that a camel could get through if nailed down really low and you know I've heard that one before um, I but I have no idea what Jesus might have meant by that other than what it sounds like which is and Jesus seemed to be other otherwise pretty consistent on the idea that rich people were going to hell um, he, he was. Um, he was pretty anti-rich, uh, anti-wealth. Um, it seems to me in most of his sayings. It, um, but the the rope and the eye of the needle and other other uh, insights from reading the uh, original text is something I'm not I'm not able to do. Well, Rick, did you say that this man had translated from the original into current English? I believe it was back in the 30s he did oh. that. He was raised in an enclave in the mountains just outside Iran that, uh, where they still spoke the old dialect and kept alive many of the ancient traditions. And he was educated in the, in the Catholic Church. But he came over to this country speaking English very well translated the New Testament into English from the Aramaic that his people had used. Uh, their Bible that stemmed, I believe, from the fourth century. And uh, he was very warmly welcomed by the evangelicals and the fundamentalists who thought this is brilliant until they realized several years later that much of what they taught was contradicted by this and their theology was going to have to be tremendously changed so that all of a sudden they turned on him and denounced it and tried to come up with some explanations as to why the King James Version is the truth and anything else is false. But he has written a dozen different commentaries explaining how the Jews of Jesus's time would have understand, understood his parables and uh, his sayings and the proverbs and the slang that was used. Whereas the, the writers of the Greek versions of the uh, New Testament would not have known that. And uh, naturally the Latin translators of the Greek wouldn't have understood it nor would the English translators of both Latin and Greek understood them. So his explanations are quite illuminating. 
George Lamsa, L-A-M-S-A. Thank you, Rick. Anything else? For me? Yeah. No, it's nap time again. Okay. <laughs> Joe? Uh, yeah, um, what Rick was just saying about the different versions of the Bible and the shade of meaning, meanings and that sort of thing, it begs the question of why it is that the Almighty is not able to write coherently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question, I think. It would it it wouldn't. I don't have it. an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if 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 the Bible were really the Word of God, then you would think that it would be written in a way so that it would be clear to all of us when we read it. The meaning would be clear to all of us, and it obviously isn't because we have thousands of different uh, interpretations um, based upon it. You know, different ideas. Right. We have ten thousand different religions and um, and thirty five thousand different Christian denominations along. Yeah. That's, a lot of, that's a lot of disagreement on the one true rock word. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Joe. Thank uh, you. Rick, Rick Pearson. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, the other Rick specifically mentioned the King James Version of the Bible, but that is obviously an outdated version because, as Bart Ehrman always points out, that, and, and so do my uh, NRSV and other Bibles that it does not contain the latest and best manuscripts, mm -hmm. um, the earliest, <laughs> the earliest and best manuscripts. So would that not counter the thing about that other guy's Bible that was from like, uh, he said the 300s or fourth century CE? Because these writings that Ehrman is talking about are like from second century CE, which should be earlier. Those writings were in Greek, they were not in Aramaic. Okay. Does that answer your question, Rick? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Steve, I have a question concerning the, um, um, the, the, what is sometimes referred to as the lost chapters of the Bible, the, um, the one about, um, I don't know if I can even remember what they're called now, um, but I, I think they're in the Catholic Bible, the ones that the Apocrypha? The Protestant. Apocrypha? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you include those writings in your um, analysis? Yes, uh, but not as not a, I, I need to, when I uh, I think I mentioned that I went, I've gone through and revised the Bible and the Book of Mormon and I'm working on the Quran. Uh, I have the uh, Apocrypha at, in the website. I don't have it in the uh, SAD book, you know, the, the, um, right. the physical book. Um, but I need to go back and do the, uh, uh, re revise the Apocrypha as well. Okay. But, but it is there on the website, yeah. Okay, thank you. Meg, you had your hand up? Yes, I just want to say we uh, when we're talking about the Bible, and of course Steve has mostly been talking about oh conundrums, puzzles, disagreements. We in this community, atheists, skeptics, etc., tend to look at the Bible and consider, think about it in terms of its literal meaning. And yet, one of the important things <laughs> as humans, I was thinking again back to those charismatic preachers. The comfort, think of how many all of us love hearing our favorite Bach ceremony, uh, your favorite Bach, Bach, you know, your favorite rock of Rolling Stone. One of the natures of human beings is we love repetition. So going, and when people start quoting from the Bible, you go to your friend's funerals and everybody's quoting, I don't know, the same 10 passages. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. Uh, walk <laughs> the valley of death. <laughs> Yes. And there's a great joy and no, not joy. What comfort, repetition, rightness, relaxation in continual repetition. That's not just ceremony, but the comfort of repetition. And I think that has a lot to do with the Bible. In fact, it'd be interesting to see which are the, there are so many Bible concordances with counts of number of words. 
but I'm sure there are the most reproduced passages. So I think oh, yeah. the, the emotionality, we in this community are big science fans, rationality, history, but we're governed so much by beauty, comfort, community that, in fact, Steve, there's something. Did the Bible, did you, the text you were reading in any of the three, Mormon, Mormon, Bible, Christianity, and the other guys, uh, the Quran, <laughs> were the text full of directions to read me every day? I am the Bible, read me. I am the Quran, read me. No, in fact, I, it, that's, that's I, I don't know if it's there at all in the Bible. Um, because the Bible, the, the authors of the Bible didn't know they were going to be in the Bible, you know, the, <laughs> at the time they weren't in the Bible, you know, they were just writing, they were writing stuff and it ended up later on, they were included in the Bible. So no, they, there's nothing that I can think of in the Bible, the book of Mormon or the, well, the when Joseph Smith wrote the book of Mormon, I think he knew what he was doing, but there's nothing that says in the book of Mormon that says, read me. Um, although it talks about itself quite a bit in the Book of Mormon. So it's a little bit there. And the, and the Quran talks a little bit about the Quran and how great it is as well. So there's a little bit of that in the Book of Mormon and in the Quran because they knew what they were, you know, they knew what was going on there, the authors of that, I, I think. But the authors of the Bible didn't know. They didn't know they'd ever be in the Bible, I don't think. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, your your comment about uh, the like the twenty three third Psalm at the at funerals, and then there's a there are passages from some of Paul's uh, writings that are that show up in almost every wedding. Um, there are certain um, certain passages of the Bible that everyone is familiar with, um, and that's really about all that most people are familiar with are the ones that they hear at the by at, at weddings at funerals um that sort of thing <clears throat> and it's amazing how you know there'd just be a few pages uh, of that material would only be a few pages i read the same things over and over again I, yeah. I i was telling steve and some other people that i went to uh set shiva with someone the other night and um the, uh, it was a more formal shiva than most, I think, but they, they had a cantor and she had a wonderful voice and it was very interesting. But one of the uh, statements in the, in the reading was that, um, now, now I can't remember how it went. Um, Jim, do you remember how it went about, oh, of all the, of all the gods that are worshiped, I'm the best one. <laughs> kind of a paraphrase, but it was basically what it said. And I, I just found it interesting, one, that the Old Testament acknowledged that there were other gods at the time, um, or at least this writing did. I don't know if it was really part of the Old Testament. Um, and that, you know, he, of course, that's part of the commandments is uh, also have no other god before you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they knew there were other gods that were out there being worshipped. Um, it just um, was fascinating to me that they said that out loud in a in a, a recitation by the whole group. Well, I think we've uh, kind of. Uh, done this all we can and and steve i have to tell you that no i do not think that you speak like moses and <laughs> <laughs> when i first wrote him to see if he would come and talk with us he said that um he quoted the bible thing about moses and i didn't know what it was i had to go read it fortunately he gave me a link to it um, but that moses wasn't a very good speaker for god and god chose someone else to speak for him moses um, moses had he said the way he phrased it is he had uncircumcised lips. Uncircumcised lips. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was really funny. But you you certainly do not appear to have uncircumcised lips. So <laughs> I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, thank you so much. And um, 
we look forward to having you come back and talk to us about uh, some of the, the new things you come up with and, and your new books. And uh, everybody got a everybody got a link to uh, your books on Amazon. So hopefully we'll have some sales for you. Um, any questions before we close down? Any comments or anything? Uh, just to say thanks, Steve, really interesting. Applause, applause. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting um, and I appreciate it very much. You're getting, um, being willing to put yourself online like this. Uh, and thank everybody for coming. Uh, if you are pleased with our programs, please tap the like button and then subscribe to our channel. Don't forget the bell so you don't miss any notices of new material. We usually post new content every week. See our created playlists to discover events thus far this year, or to see a list of topics and speakers from our rapidly growing and diverse collection since 1992.